Hey, Gabby's here. Good morning, all. Morning. Good morning, everyone. Mike, can you listen to me? You're all right? Uh, yeah, I can listen to you very okay. well. Great, okay, great, great. Okay. So we have people from Mexico here. We have people from Colombia as well. Hi, where is everybody else joining us from? From Argentina as well. Very good. Welcome from Laos. From Laos. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. So it's a very um, international audience we have today. <laughs> yes. We usually have this kind of audience. We're really glad to have you all here. Um, my name is Israel. Yes, I'm from Venezuela, from Iraq. Wonderful. Hey, thank you very much for being here. Right, so we're about to get there very soon. Let me just finish a meeting. People in the waiting room and get excited very soon. Right, thank you very thank you very much for that information today. So participants from over 25 countries. Yeah. Um, Egypt. Yeah. yeah. Mike, before uh, before before uh, we formally start, I would like to remind everyone about certificates because we always get these questions on the media team uh, email account. Please, to all of us joining from Facebook and from Zoom, remember that we have personalized certificates to those joining the live session. And in order to receive a certificate, you must complete the form that we will send by the end of this webinar. We're going to send it through the chat, and we're also going to send it through email to all of those who registered. And the form is going to be open for a couple of hours so you can fill it in. And then we're going to start sending certificates in 24 to 48 hours. If something happens and we take a little more, like with the last one, we're going to send you an email notified, okay? But please do not forget to complete the form and do not forget to properly write your name and especially your email address because if there is a mistake, the email won't be sent, okay? Thank you, guys. All right, so thank you very much. And let's get started straight away. So uh, I want to welcome you all to today's uh, PhD webinar. I chose engaging students through product development and online PPL experience by uh, with Professor Johannes Rohan. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about this. Um, so uh, teachers face challenges every day, a question on what to do, on how to do it, 
uh, to engage students, meet their needs, and achieve their goals and arrive constantly. In that sense, they need to implement an approach that puts the student's learning process arises, especially now when remote teaching is taking place. PBL is an approach designed to give students the opportunity to develop knowledge and skills through engaging projects set around challenges and problems that they may face in the real world. It also brings as a result that the students develop deep content knowledge, as well as critical thinking, collaboration, creativity, and communication skills. Additionally, the proper use of uh, free online resources can allow students on a one-to-one -one lesson, as well as a teamwork, develop simple tasks to accomplish real goals and meet the needs they have while working on a project. So uh, let me also tell you a little bit about our presenter today. Uh, Johannes Rojas is currently the CEO and Academic Director of the Office for an Online Language School. Uh, Johannes Rojas is a foreign language teacher with, with more than 15 years of experience with studies in his home country, Venezuela, and abroad. And he has taught English at different levels, at different educational levels, devoting most of his time uh, or most of his years of teaching at university level. Additionally, he has worked for different online programs teaching Spanish to foreign uh, students. So let me go ahead and uh, welcome Professor Johannes Rojas. Thank you, Miguel, for, I mean, for your warm welcome and thank you, Adventista, for the invitation for this webinar. And everybody, thank you for joining us today, I mean, for this event. I'm very happy and honored to be here. Adventista is part, a great part of my life. And I'm very happy to be here today, this morning with you all. So, uh, Mikey, I'm just waiting for you to go. Can we start right away or? Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Give me a sec so you guys can see. <clears throat> Please let me know uh, when you guys can see my, my presentation. Yes, you can already see it there. Great, okay. So I'm just going <clears> to... <throat> Go on a full screen here. There, is it? Yeah, shown correctly? Great. Great, so as I said, I'm very happy to be here. So the talk for today of this webinar, it's titled Engage a Student Through Project Development and Online PBL Experience. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about how we uh, deal with uh, our teaching process and everything on our language school, the Otters Corner. We're based here in Lima, though, um, and Venezuela. Um, so for you to know before we start, <clears throat> the way we conduct uh, our lessons in our language school is a one-to-one -one teacher student. However, for working with projects, as you are going to see, we have spaces where students work together and develop different tasks, and you will see that now. So this is a glimpse to the presentation or to the webinar today. We're gonna to be dealing first with a general overview about what project-based learning is. Then we're just gonna go with uh, some main considerations and some things that teacher must take into account when deciding working with PBL in their lessons, in their courses. We're gonna review also some tools for remote teaching or that are useful resources for, I mean, implementing a PBL approach in remote teaching and we're going to go on the last three I mean, aspects or point on a project we call Just I Can Project in our school. This is one of the first projects our students work with in, in the school, especially when they're beginners. We're going to revise that experience. We're going to check some outcomes and see the competencies um, or how competent learners can get. And finally, we're going to get some final considerations. So this is the glimpse for the presentation. So you have it in mind. So project-based learning, a general overview. So uh, we have here two definitions that are very wide and also very I mean, explicit on what it is. 
It is uh, defines PBL as an instructional approach designed to give students the opportunity to develop knowledge and skills through engaging projects set around challenges and problems they may face in the real world. So it means that students are not going to be getting only uh, language skills, but they're also going to be able to get some other type of skills like critical thinking, I mean, working collaboratively. And as the other definition says, as you can say, it's working with PBL brings us a result that students develop deep content knowledge, as well as critical thinking, collaboration, creativity, and communication skill. It means that we're facing an approach and then we're going to be taking a look into something that brings the best from students. Uh, while we implement this type of approach in our lessons, students are not only getting language skills, which is what we really want them to do, but also the competency on how to use it, what to use it, where to use it, and how to use it, okay? Along with some other skills that are necessary, like working collaboratively, I mean, developing creativity and critical thinking, depending on the tasks that are presented in the different levels of language acquisition. So there are some key points that we need to bear in mind when we <clears throat> talk about PBL, which are uh, necessary, okay? Um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, exactly. These key points may vary depending on who presents uh, the perception or perspective from PBL, but generally when we work with this, these are the points that we need to address or we have in this approach or we need to take into consideration. First, there is always a need that we're challenging problems or questions that need to be answered. And not only about language skills, but also it looks for developing deep content in students and other type of abilities. So an inquiry, it's needed, I mean, in order to provide authenticity for the project to be sustained and work for each group. And the application of learning, it's not only about teaching the language to students, I mean, like in a regular basis, but also it's about how we are using this approach and developing activities and tasks in order for the students to apply what they are learning in different situations or contexts or activities or tasks that demand from them not only the use of language, but also their creativity, collaborative skills, critical thinking, and so on, so on. So the integration, it's also something a must, like mandatory in this type of work. It's not like I'm just gonna develop a project which is one person or with its students individually working isolated. No, it is necessary not only to integrate all the language skills and collaborative skills and critical thinking skills and working with creativity through the different tasks developed, but also students need to work together. They need to build the knowledge together. The voice and choice from students, I mean, it's necessary to be taken into account. They may not know at the beginning what their needs are, but talking to them is always essential. So you can discover with them what is it that they need, that you need to work and attack in the best sense in order to get the best results. There is always a product at the end that it has to be shown, not just for the teacher, but also for the students to see the progress they have had. And finally, a feedback and reflection from the teacher and from the student themselves. There is a small note here that says PBL is a flexible and then is flexible and dynamic. It looks different from every group, and it's true. I cannot address every group that I have or um, individual with the same tasks uh, because it has worked for other group for another group. It's not like that. Okay, it has to be flexible and dynamic, and the tasks. I'm gonna vary depending on the needs you have for your student. It's not only about language needs. Yes, yes, that's the main goal for us, yes. But it's also about developing in the student other type of abilities, which it should be a, a must, I mean, for us as teacher, not only using the language, like learn, teaching them how to use the language, but also where to use it. I mean, to be thinkers, the, when and how and where they use the language. So. PBL in, I mean, to sum up and in short, those key points look for one thing, not just about knowing, but using. That's what PBL promotes in student. It promotes 
the use of what students know. The application of learning, in this case, the language, not only for the sake of using the language, but where to use it, how to use it. It develops in students at uh, higher pragmatic levels. So some may considerations or the musts that teachers uh, sh should and must consider. First of all, uh, you need to keep it real. I mean, the way you're gonna be developing the project, where you're going to get, I mean, with the project, what needs are you addressing, how you're preparing the a different task, it needs to be real. Know your students' need is very imperative that you really know what are the needs from, I mean, your group. Maybe you manage one, two, three different groups, big groups, small groups. The needs are going to vary, and your perspective from your experience is very valuable on this. And also, you need to listen to their voice, as we said, in order to prepare something that I mean, it's I mean for them, useful. You need to consider the possible ways to address those needs. I mean, based on the information you have, and then you have to make this inquiry, which is best. I have this option, I have this option. It could work here. I have used this, and it is a similar group to the other one in, in a manner. So maybe this can work, maybe this cannot work. So you need to consider all the possibilities and finally set a realistic goal. You cannot set goals that are not unreachable in the sense of time, resources, Okay, we know that most of the time we lack of resources, especially if we work on public places. So when we work with PBL, we need to set a realistic goal. This is what I have. This is what I can do. This is where I want my students to reach at the end of this course. And it's possible because I count on this and this and this. And when you meet that goal, I mean, that's the most rewarding thing ever, not just for you, but also for the learners. Number two, you need to set an environment and it's your responsibility to provide the necessary space for students to be immersed and involved in not only in the use of language and how to use it and where to use it, but the development of other abilities, which PBL six. Plan and design purposeful tasks and activities. Students need to see the meaning and the purpose in every task we develop. If there is no meaning, if they see no point in doing this, where is it taking me? How is it helping me? What is it useful for? That's when we get students not engaged in our lessons. So the tasks and the activities that we need to prepare, especially for this type of approach, need to be purposeful. You need to provide the environment and spaces where students apply what they learn. It's what we're saying. This approach seeks to make students use in context or contextualize, silly talking like they need to use this. They need to see where they can apply knowledge. If we teach the language, but then we don't teach them how to do how to apply it. We don't teach them where to use it. We don't we don't show the student the purpose of using the language and where they can use it then again, we're not going to get our students engaged. They're just going to be in our rooms, taking some course, making some activities, or, you know, just um, getting a past score in, in, in their exam, in their quizzes, but really they're not going to see the point of it, which is sad because language gives these students a great opportunity and a different way to see the world. Also, by setting the environment, it is very important to promote peer work. Working in project demands collaborative work. Most of the students, I mean, can be willing in, in some courses, some other students, I have faced myself with students that they want to work just alone, they don't want to work in a group. So it is our responsibility to guide them in this process and show them how important collaboration is for constructing language, since language is a social matter. Address progress is also very, very, very important thing of the whole process of working in PBL. You need to leave space for feedback, proof, and self-reflection. Students need to be assessed properly. When we, need, when we say they need to be assessed properly, it's not just about quizzes or final tests, 
or midterms, they need to be assessed during the whole process through different activities where you can see the progress, where they can perceive their progress, and they can see how they are doing in the language learning process. And not just, I mean, realizing that they're using the language, but they need to be aware how they're using it and that they're competent, fully competent in the sense, I know the language, the teacher is teaching me, I'm using it properly and, and, and it's good. You need peer evaluation also has to be present there. It needs to be there, collaboration, as I'm saying. So students need to address other students. I mean, it's necessary that they can see it, the progress in other peers. And I mean, they can get comments and they can get, I mean, some other question about how you're doing this. I mean, it was very good for you to do this. I'm very happy you were able to make this presentation this way. Can you teach me? We need to create this sense of collaboration and I mean, and partnership among the groups we have or in the groups we have, because it is necessary for building language uh, uh, construction and getting the language we need. Awareness must be fostered, the students' competencies, students need to be aware every time since the very beginning where these are your needs, these are the needs we have as a group, you include there as a teacher, and we need to work on this. So the competencies we need to acquire are these, these are the ones we have, and in the middle of the process, this is what we have been reaching, and when the, 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 the project finishes, when the course ends, then you all guys need to be aware, students and the teacher, yes, we are competent now, the goal was reached. Students need to know that it makes them feel secure. It makes them feel confident about the language they know. And it's easier for them to keep acquiring new language skills or other skills. I don't know if there's a uh, Miguel uh, question so far or something, please just let me know. And then I, I can stop. I mean, just to answer one or two questions and then continue. That's okay. So far, we haven't got any questions, but hopefully, we will have some. At, oh, we have one from Rosa Maria. Um, is that an example of how to do it online or virtual? I yes, uh, there is an example, and I'm gonna show it by. I mean, in like in the third point, talking about the Yes I Can project, she will see it. All right, wonderful. Um, so, Rosa, you can pose your questions on the go while we professor. Uh, uh, Johannes is just speaking, and then we can stop for a little bit, read them, and discuss them. All right. Okay. So, number three, our aspect uh, it's useful resources, some tools for remote teaching. I mean, Normally we face that, I mean, most of the information about project-based learning in space on regular teaching, like in a classroom with a group, with the students, and yes, that is where it has been implemented. But lately it has gained more and more popularity, even on online. So we decided to give it a try and we decided to go on and following some people that were doing it to see how they were doing it and then make uh, ourselves or adapting ourselves to this. I mean, according to the needs <clears throat> and the things and the context we have in our language school. So some of the tools that are very important, I mean, or that we use that we consider, and those are the examples you're gonna watch, I mean, in, later on. It's, I mean, first lessons need to be contextualized. They need to be meaningful and real. If, if students are exposed to lessons like the regular ones, um, Jane and Peter and yeah, I mean, just grammar and some vocabulary with a picture of, um, of two guys there. I mean, a girl and a man talking and that's it. And I mean, the main focus is grammar and vocabulary in an isolated way. And there is not a context, a real life um, experience that they can relate to, or they do not see purpose in using this language. Okay, this is the grammar, this is the vocabulary. Where am I supposed to apply it? There is just an example there on the book about a conversation or there is an audio, or maybe there is a picture. But then <clears throat> if it is not meaningful or real enough for them, that they can see themselves in a situation similar that the lesson is providing them, then the lesson, I mean, it's not meaningful, it's not real. So you need to work on these aspects for your lessons, whether you use books, you create your own material, you use some other resources, they need to be contextualized. Students need to see themselves in the situations where, I mean, where, I mean that the lessons are describing. 
So they need to revive something they lived or they need to see themselves, yes, someday I can live this situation as well. And it is useful for me, I need to learn. This is where I'm going to use everything that I've been learning. The support material, they need to be reliable and assertive. Any support material, it's <clears throat> welcome. I mean, you're talking about pictures, you're talking about list of words, you're talking about, I mean, uh, um, charts, uh, infographics. I mean, you can have tons of resources in order to support the contextualized lesson, but they need to be reliable and assertive in the sense that they need to be linked and connected directly to what you're teaching and what they feel it's useful for them according to what they've been learning in their lessons. It's not that we're going to have a contextual lesson as the one we just described, and then the support material is going to be just isolated, like there, I mean, with no explanation, I mean, with no purpose, they need to see it is assertive, that it is reliable, that this they're going to use as a support material. It's giving them even more skill and the chance to keep improving what they've been learning in those lessons. The audiovisual aids, of course, are necessary, especially for us that we're teaching now, remote teaching. And if you ask me, I do think that even, I mean, with the pandemic gone someday, which I hope it's soon, most institutions are going to be working online for a tons of resources. I mean, time saving, maybe money saving, and so on. But this is not going anywhere. Remote teaching came and it's going to be here I mean, for a long time. So the audiovisual aids are essential for us to work with them, but not any audiovisual aid, just like, hey, I just want to put this video there. So if they want to watch it, they can watch it. Or if they don't watch it well, it doesn't matter. No, I mean, the audiovisual aids, whether are pictures or podcasts, or videos, or audios, they need to be useful and convenient. They need to be, again, linked. It's like a change that you need to be there linked to the different things and resources you're using so students can see purpose and use on everything you're providing to them. It's not like they have a choice to watch it. They do have a choice, but you need to make your students want to, to see, to watch, to work with, to revise, even when they're not in live sessions that they just can enter their I mean, their, their platform, anytime they want to check some material because they know the material that they're gonna find there is useful and convenient and will give you extra information. We'll give you we'll give them the chance to practice. We'll um, I mean, give them the chance to review everything that they have been finding useful in their lessons. So those are some aspects that we cannot overlook when we talk about audiovisual aids. As we say, we work on a one-to-one -one, uh, base, I mean, teaching lessons, but I mean, in every course we have basic one, basic two, Spanish or, or English that we teach students also have spaces where they interact with other students that are in the same level, basic one, basic two, intermediate, and they work in tasks in order to develop a final product of a project. So where does it happen? Student takes lessons individually, but then we have here discussion forums, which must be collaborative and communicative. On these forums, you're gonna see an example of it in some minutes. On this forum, students discuss, project, I, I mean, present ideas, make questions to other peers, they, they contact their teachers about an activity and something they need to develop. It could be a discussion, a simple discussion. It could be something like, for example, in basic three, we have a, a, an activity that it's related to food, which is the best way to cook it. And then they discuss about different recipes and I mean, the best way to address it. There is an input from the language school, I mean, as an example, and then they start developing things because the end of this, um, of it, for example, of that project is for them to, I mean, record themselves preparing a recipe. So that's the final product they're going to shut, for example, in that. But then they have spaces where they kind of discuss about this, use the language and the vocabulary they've been learning, discussing with their peers that are on the same level. I mean, using the language they're learning in tasks and activities that have some meaning for them in these forums. Interactive practice, you also will see what's that, what that is. Some learn, virtual learning environments, some VLEs, 
allow you to make, I mean, sort of quizzes or practices that are multiple choice. And these type of exercises, they need to be helpful and engaging since students can do it on their own and then check it with the teachers. That's the way we manage it here. And they see their progress, what competences they have acquired. They are able to spot their strengths and their weaknesses if they still have some. And they are able to, able to address those things with the teacher later on because they know and they're going to be aware of where they are in their learning process. So they're helpful, they're helpful and very engaging because in our case, the students can enter at different times to take the interactive practice during the whole learning process of a course to see how they have been progressing and checking that. I mean, this was my previous attempt and I had these mistakes, but now I don't have any. Or yes, I keep having the same problem. I'm, I, I'm good at this now, but then this one is still giving me problems. So we know exactly where and how to attack, I mean, a, a need in every student. So then he or she can be working in the forums and in the other spaces with other students better and improving the language. Then we have life meetings of practices, which means they need to be challenging safe. It's something that we use in our language school. We gather a group of students on the same level on tasks where they need to work with the language that they have been learning in, in the course. I mean, and we work with semi-control activities or sometimes very communicative activities, depending on the level, where students work in small groups in same level that are on the same level to develop a task that is part of the project they are being, they are working on. Okay, so some other thing about these practices or live meetings we have uh, is that some sometimes most of the times we expose the English students to a native speaker. As I told you, we have Spanish program and English program. So sometimes we work in these integration lessons where the native speaker helps the English students or, or vice versa, where the Spanish native speaker can help the Spanish learners in activities. Uh, All right, so Professor Johans, we have a question over here from Facebook. Um, someone asked the following question. How possible this Oh, how possible does it come for teachers who are usually tied to working with the school books uh, the associates to buy? And I guess has to do with how we can incorporate this if they are tied to using the school book every single day, every single lesson. And if you could give them some tips on how to make both things work. Okay. Um... Yeah, I know that you, we regularly, when we work in school, guys, we have to, I mean, follow a program and they give you, I mean, the, the textbook, they give you this is where you're going to teach and this is how you're going to work. And it's okay, I understand that then in most cases we do need, I mean, we do need to follow that. I understand it completely, uh, but there are some ways in which you can incorporate a little activities or little by little some activities in your regular daily basics units where you see that students are doing something else besides filling a book on a fill in the blanks. I'm not against the fill in the blanks exercises. They are necessary in some contexts. They, they serve their purpose. And it's okay to do, the, I mean, to go on a book, it's okay to work on activity on a book, but students need, they need to do something. They need to be exposed to doing and in the doing, they need to be exposed, I mean, to use the language. And if the book does not bring any activity that you consider that a student is, I mean, you as teacher know this is not helpful for them. They just put in their vocabulary and filling a gap. And then I can correct the book and say, oh, yeah, he put the correct word. But he could he put the correct word because you taught the word. But uh, yeah. does he know really how to use it? That is up to us. I know it's difficult. Yeah. I know the time is little. But guys, uh, there is always a moment where we need to give our students the gift of using what we are doing. Maybe you don't have to have, you need to have a big project like for the whole course. I have also followed some people who works in, on small projects for units, unit by unit with different tasks that they made their students work and then they show a final product 
and it doesn't have to be something huge. For example, if you're teaching your students, I mean, um, introductions, I mean, talk about others and yourself and their personal aspects, then you can learn different tasks where the final product could be a small video profile where they introduce themselves, I'm someone from their family. And it's a simple activity and it's a simple project. And it's part of what you have to teach because every book text, I mean textbook, sorry, has a unit that talks about introductions, for example. So you need to teach them how to use it. All right, thank you for that answer. We also have a comment from Ronald uh, from Valencia, Venezuela. My project are based upon actual news reports like uh, hashtag me too and George Floyd. Students are invited to use investigation, open-mindedness, and critical thinking to improve their way of forming opinions. During the process, we use discussion, debate, and role play. Thank you, it's a uh, wonderful idea. Use uh, news. Totally, totally. Uh, and when he mentions debates and things like that, I mean, I mean, we as teachers should not be scared of that. I mean, my students have not a level for making a debate or a discussion. There are debates and discussions that do not, do not need, I mean, an extensive knowledge of the language, nor, uh, you know, complex structures. I mean, I'm going to show you that because, because I'm, I mean, I'm, I mean, the example I brought it's from the Yes I Can project where students, they didn't have any knowledge of English at the beginning and they were working on simple small tasks, which product was a final video. I mean, talking about the competencies they had acquired, you'll see that, so it's possible. So what he's saying, Ronald is saying, it's, so, it's possible not only for an intermediate high or advanced level, it can also work out on a basic level if you know how to manage, if you design the activities carefully. Yeah. We also have a question from Rodri. Uh, what criteria do you, do you utilize for effective assessment in CDL? Uh, what tools is saying? What tools? Um, criteria. Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, when we, when we talk about addressing the progress and then having a, um, a proper uh, assessment, okay? So, I mean, yes, you need to address and assess, of course, the language use. And uh, I mean, if it's using the language you're teaching, of course, because that's part of it. And at the end, if you work for an institution, that's what they're gonna be requiring, okay? But the criteria that you need to use, I mean, on working on PBL will depend on the needs and the group you're managing. It's not also about, I mean, it's not only, sorry, about the language, what I'm saying, which is true, you need it, especially if you work for an institution that is gonna demand that from you. But you as a teacher and working with a particular group need to assess other type of abilities. Is he working collaboratively? Is he helping the, the other students? Is he integrating in the peer work? When he gives a peer assessment, I mean, talking to his, his partners about the way they did the activity, how does he address them? And <clears throat> you need to work on uh, addressing that also, not just the progress in language and in those abilities, but addressing the students' participation and the attitude they have while they're working on the activity. So yes, you need to develop criteria not only for language, but for collaborative, I mean, I mean, collaborative jobs and works, I mean, for critical thinking, for peer evaluation. So you can see the whole problem. So mainly when we work with PBL, I mean, we should address on a descriptive assessment way, like, you know, like making reports in our case, in the language school, teachers work with an everyday report every time they find, I mean, they have a, a lesson with the student. And apart from that, we also work on a report that is filled out that, I mean, take the main points of the student, not only in language, we know their abilities, like working collaboratively, um, talking to the peers, being helpful. I mean, he has certain level of analysis. All those things are considered in the reports we feel. So at the end of the, course, we can show the student the progress he made, not just in language, but also in all these other abilities that we have been mentioning. I hope that answers, right. I mean, the question. <laughs> Is there any other one? Definitely, definitely. Yeah, we have a comment from, a uh, comment and question from Raphael Mark. Interactions are kind of a key point by the time of using these resources, isn't it? Like music, short interviews, collaborative activities, and so on. 
It's 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 it, you made it's that a question, Mikey. Sorry, I mean I lost you for a moment. Uh, yeah, that's okay. So um, in this case, Rafael is asking about uh, interaction being the main focus of using these resources. Oh yes, totally. I mean, like any resource is welcome. I mean, I heard I, I got that he said he said something about music and interviews, right? I mean, you see this yeah. type of, uh, yeah. I mean, any resource is welcome if it has a purpose for the student to feel, I mean, they, they see the purpose there. If you see the purpose, you need to show the student the purpose on how this is gonna be helpful for them or not. If the student sees that an activity, that a task, it's completely unrelated to what he's been learning. Even when what he's been learning, it's contextualized, contextualized and good, the student immediately, maybe not willingly, but unconsciously, he will reject that and he will see no purpose of use of that. If using music, it's sure. part of a task that is gonna be involved, sorry, in the development of a project and there is a purpose for that, the student will appreciate it and you will see results on it. Sure. Okay, any other question? No. We haven't got any more questions so far. Okay, so okay, proceed. okay, great. So the Yes I Can, it's an online experience we have. As you can see here, it's one of the projects developed in early levels in our schools. I mean, it's the first project actually every student is exposed to. As I said, remember that in our schools, we were on a one-to-one, -one, I mean, class first, but then as the student progress in his first level, he's gonna be exposed to different tasks where he's gonna work asynchronously or synchronously with some other students that are in the same level, okay? <clears throat> Since the students are new, for example, when they enter, I mean, our schools and they don't have language skills or very basic, basic, basic language skills, this is the first projects they work on. And this project seeks to get three different things, develop confidence in students, make them aware of the language skills they have and the ones they're going to be getting and the ones they get at the end of it. And of course, developing the competencies and competencies is not only about language, I mean, like he knows the word, he knows the structure, but also the pragmatic level, even in very basic. I know what I'm learning. I know where to use it. I know how to use it. Okay, so working on this in our school, it's, I mean, main, I mean, one of our main things, because, I mean, in order to develop projects, in order to develop tasks for having the students getting, getting involved in this, we follow like this small stair you see of words there. We set examples in our lessons. Then the teacher models what he wants a student to do. Then the teacher has the opportunity to practice it on his own and, and receive feedback and address progress from the teacher. And finally, they're gonna be performing the task to get feedback. Students are not gonna be working on something just read from an instruction that the teacher is giving them. No, the teacher is gonna give the instructions. He's gonna set an example. They're gonna have a model of it. They're gonna have a practice before the main thing happens where the student is really gonna be assessed, for example, to get scores. And finally, he's gonna get the chance to present it and I mean, be assessed properly, not just about the other things that we are talking about, but also the language, the language and get feedback. There is always need while you're working in any approach, not just in PBL, but now we're talking about this. You need to set examples and models and give your students a chance to practice before you demand from them a task that is gonna be a score. If that is not there, if you just give the students instruction, but you do not show what uh, you want them to have, what you want them to do, then, I mean, there is no purpose in the student because the student is gonna see the purpose of doing something when he sees you using the language, the, I mean, in what context you're using it and what it is useful for. And for that, you need to provide examples, models and practice for demanding a task and then finally give it uh, the feedback. So I'm gonna show you how we have been working with our experience. The examples that you're gonna be watching now are based on our basic one level, which demands uh, four different competencies. Uh, talk about myself and others to use proper introductions, um, expressing and describing daily activities that I can do and some others also do, um, stating likes and preferences, relating hobbies and any other activities, 
and also uh, talking about my origins and knowing origins from other people and their culture. These are the competencies and communicative functions where, I mean, we want the students uh, to develop and these are the ones we're working on and that's what you're gonna see here. For example, talking about the context for light lessons. Uh, if you can see here, there are three screenshots, uh, small screenshots of a uh, Unit one, this is me, is a unit that is completely contextualized. I mean, we, we established and we said that our units in language, <clears throat> in our language school, they need to be real and about real life. It's necessary that they see themselves in these situations. If not, the student may not have a purpose of learning. They are skillful. They provide the student with communicative functions and the competences they need in order to talk and to speak and to use the language. I mean, in a very assertive way in specific context. And they're purposeful in the sense that when you teach the language, there is also a part in our units that talks about the language targets. What areas, what contexts, which environments you can be involved when using this language. Okay, so the students are exposed to it. So they see that it is, this is useful. We have, I mean, something in our school that is very important. First of all, we need to think of the student on these three main phrases you see there. Tell me what, teach me how, show me where. The students demand for us, tell me what I need to learn. So we have to teach them what they need to learn. It's true. But also the students asked us, teach me how am I going to use it? Because if you tell me what to, to learn and I learn it, but it's there, just the word, I can recognize it. I know this is the present simple. I know this the word it's used for describing whatever. <coughs> <laughs> if they do not know how to use it, it's useless. So tell me what I need to learn, teach me how I can use it, and finally show me where I can use it. It's the demand of any student, even though when they do not say it, is what you need to have in mind in order to teach students the language. When you teach them what to do, you're teaching the language. When you teach them how to use it, then you're helping them to reach other thinking levels and show me where then you're telling, I mean, you're showing them and you're teaching them how to be assertive when using the language, which is related to pragmatics. We need to develop lessons like this from the very beginning. The example you're watching here is from unit one. For students <clears throat> that are not, I mean, or do not have language skills. The support material and audiovisual aids uh, this is, for example, also from basic one, as you can see here, where are you from? And then you have uh, self-study material, which are handouts that students use and develop. And then they can check with their students which exercises that are completely related to the contextualized lessons they have. And these materials, whatever you use, handouts, uh, podcasts, or uh, videos, they need to evoke reality. Students need to see themselves in those, I mean, resources. They need to see that this is real, that this is likely to happen, that they are likely to revive an experience they have had or that they will live an experience. And they need to provide authenticity. It is necessary that the student sees in every material that you have, in this case, in your platform, it's related to what he's learning and what happens in real life. As you can see here, it's where are you from? This video shows the student, this video shows the students, I mean, uh, an interview that a lot of tourists are getting in Washington because they were interested in knowing how many tourists were visiting in that time. So in on this video, students will be able to see uh, different tourists from different countries talking about where they come from, the language they speak and their nationalities as part of what they're learning in their unit two, who talks about nationalities and languages. So they have, I mean, they have been tourists sometimes in different countries, maybe one day, one, one time, two times, twice in their lives, or maybe they're planning to be tourists because next year, whenever they're planning to travel, so it's an, they need to see how they can manage. I mean, this is a learning and this is a context where it can happen, where it may be able to use a language they're teaching me. So they need to be exposed to that. <clears throat> okay, uh, we this, have some comments uh -huh, before yes. 
you know, and you can also have a sip of water. Um, we have some comments here from Ramon Oviedo. Um, he says, in PBL, the purpose is an essential key. Uh, the teacher has to explain the students what they have to do. Um, we also have Mr. Steven, Ronald, Ronald Steven, saying most of the students are scared to speak a foreign language because they are afraid to be judged. Um, we as teachers need to show them that during conversations in a different language, the participants are not listening if you make a mistake, but I mean, you just want to uh, make sure that they, they get themselves understood. Yes. Okay, so yeah, that, that, that's a great comment. Yes, thank you, Mikey. Yes, that's true. Uh, that's why, I mean, PBL provides the opportunity to, for students to work in couples or even in small groups where they can interact with other students in the same level. Maybe one of them is more advantageous than the other one. Yes, but it's good because if you really foster what collaborative work is, then that student is going to be of a great help for the other ones. So there's no need for judging. And yes, uh, we need to seek for our students to be intelligible. I mean, we're not preparing na little native speakers. And that's something you need mm -hmm. to tell them. And also, they need to know that you have also struggled as a learner. Now you're a teacher, but once you were a learner. And mm -hmm. they also know, they need to know also that you once struggled and that you were able to do it. And that you're there for helping them to get what they need. <clears throat> okay. It is so far. Those are the comments and questions we've got. You may continue now. Okay, great. Talking about the discussion forums, I mean, what you see here, it's the forum and discussion forum or the activity or task for students that are in basic one. And what you see there on the first picture, it's us giving examples. I mean, it was me, I was also teaching basic one in that moment and also another teacher. But then you see here an example of the student. I mean, Anna and in this case, uh, Leo, uh, they were, I mean, Leo is from Cuba and Anna is uh, Venezuela and she is in uh, Florida. But she uh, didn't speak, I mean, any English. She also said when uh, we were interviewing her for starting classes that she had a concrete tongue. Uh, yeah, tongue made of concrete. So uh, it was amazing to see how they were developing their lessons and also the different tasks. And then finally, when they met, they get to meet some peers that are on the same level, they were able to communicate and to get to know each other in this asynchronous activity. Discussion. I mean, this is just a simple activity for basic one. It's about personal information. It's about origins. It's about talking about, I mean, what you do every day. Yes. I mean, it was simple for them, but it was great because they didn't know anything about the language. So discussion forums foster collaboration. They help each other. They allow peer assessment. Hey, you know what? This is the right way to do it. We have got that. Like, then one student can make a mistake and the other one says and writes the correct sentence and say, I think it's better if you write that way. Sometimes they use their native language and then they put the phrase in English because they are in basic level, but you're getting them to make peer assessment the best way to be gentle, to collaborate with the learning process of a peer and it's great. And it also develops thinking stages, maybe at the beginning, by correcting a simple mistake like an S or like an E or aren't. It's just recognizing and knowing, but then when their levels of, I mean, the classes and the, they are advancing in their levels, the develop, I mean, developing thinking stages get higher and higher, analyzing, evaluating. So it depends on the levels they are. <clears throat> the interactive practice, what you're watching here is an interactive practice for one of our Spanish uh, courses. But they engage students. Students come here to practice alone and they can see, yes, I know, because the interactive practice gives them feedback immediately after they finish. So they promote learners' autonomy. Students can practice on their, on their own. No need for the teacher to be here. If they want to revise it with the teacher, they also can do it. They have options. And it creates awareness. Okay, I'm gonna take the practice because I feel I'm, I'm confident enough what we have, have, what I have learned and then the student gets immediate feedback and he knows where or she is in this moment in his learning process. 
Sometimes there are mistakes. Yes, he can revise it with a teacher. And then when he keeps revising it and working on it, they can come here and take another interactive practice and see how or she has evolved and be aware of their um, language levels and the competencies he's been or she's been acquiring. <clears throat> And live meeting practices. <clears throat> this is the main practice we have with the students where we gather small groups of students that have been working on the same level to practice the language in activities where they need to communicate, discuss, reach to a consensus, depending on the level they are. These type of activities build up confidence. Students are able to use the language as they feel secure that they are using the language and nobody's gonna judge them. And even though if I have a mistake, people can understand me and they help me correct those mistakes so I can use the language freely, so it's stress-free environment. So it empowered language use. The students finally are face-to-face -face with someone, not just a teacher, <clears throat> to talk and use the language they've been working on class individually, they have been using in the discussion forums with other peers that they know on the discussion forums. And finally, they get to meet them in a live meeting and it creates or they create meaningful experiences. It makes the students able. And at the end of this, they're able to say, yes, they can talk to other people in English. They understand me. And as you can see here on the first picture, Bradley Young is one of our students. He's a very collaborative. I mean, he's always willing to help. He always offers himself to be the, the English native speaker to be in these practices where the students are able to talk to him or to any other classmate to practice their English. So it's there helping. And then we have here, for example, on the second picture, this is for the Spanish students. And the third part, I mean, the, the student that is at, at the bottom of the picture, its name is her name is Ruth. She I study is English and she was helping us and their mates that study Spanish in an activity for practicing Spanish. This was a role play. This is Bradley again in this case, and this is Michelle. Michelle is from Wales, she's a Spanish student. And uh, they were working on these live meeting practices in this case with Ruth, who is a Spanish, I mean, native speaker who offered herself to work on this activity to help their Spanish mates to keep learning Spanish and developing the task for, I mean, being able to develop the product of the project, which I'm gonna show in some minutes. So this task, this activity, life meeting and practices is the highest thing students are gonna do at the end of, of, of a set of tasks and activities that we have developed in our environment. Finally, they're gonna be talking and using the language in real life, in real, I mean, face to face, in a matter of speaking, in a live session with other English students or with other Spanish students to being able to practice, make an activity, and finally get the confidence, empowered language, and create an experience that is so meaningful that makes them able to work on the final product. Outcomes. We have a question, Mikey? Okay. Yes, we do. Uh, we have some comments and questions and requests as well. Um, I have here Ronald saying, when I create my groups, I prevent that all the speak all the good speakers join the same group. My group show the my group shows the average level of a spoken language. So he tries to balance those who are um, more fluent with the ones who are a little bit of fluency. Uh, so they can help each other while they're doing their task. A great approach. You need to, I mean, you need to mix the groups. You need to mix yeah. the group. For example, in the picture, in the second, on the second picture you're watching, from Michelle and Bradley, the one that was less fluent in this practice was Bradley. And at the beginning, he was really intimidated by Michelle. Okay. Right. Then uh, that was the first. Uh, the first one of the first practice we had, but I'm going to show you now the development practice, the, the development that Bradley has had, because we always expose him to someone who has, I mean, uh, a little high, higher level than he has. Like you know, they are in the same course, they are in the same, in the same, in the same basic. But there is always a student that stands out. We know that we're teachers. We can see. We can spot that. But it doesn't mean we have to neglect the one that does it. We need to show him how to do it. And you have to show him. You need to show him other students that can do it and then invite him, join us here. 
because you can do it also. Okay, you do, you do not, I mean, you do not have to neglect those students. And it's not that you're going to have only students that are, had a better flu, has a better fluency, I mean, a group, and then you're just gonna have the, the other ones that they are not fluent in another group, no. If you do that, you're already telling that student, you know, you're not good enough to talk to your partner. And then you're yeah. not a teacher. I mean, you're just a guy who classifies yeah. people who has abilities and not. And it's your job to make them develop the activities. So don't do that. I mean, make a student realize the students that have less ability realize that their partners that have abilities can be of help. And also make those who have a better ability be of help for others that they do not have the abilities they have. And they are not gonna do it alone. I mean, they're students. It doesn't matter if they're adults. It's your call as a teacher. Yes, that's very true. You're, you're there to support your students. You're there to motivate them to uh, get better every single day. And by doing so, by having mixed, uh, small mixed ability uh, students uh, doing tasks, um, it will certainly be a, a, you know, a very motivating moment for them. Yes. Students, students, no matter if they're adults, it doesn't matter. Mm. They like to be rewarded and addressed. I mean, they like right. that. Even if it is very good, I'm impressed. Or even if you do not say a long sentence, but when he finishes his or her intervention, you say, wow. That for them yeah. is the world. Even if they're adults, believe me. Right. Is there any other question, Mikey? Right. No? Yes, we have some other comments over here. Um, uh, no comments. The teacher is only a model, a facilitator who arises or allows his interest in his students through his methodolog methodological strategies. Um, more appropriate than allowing, sorry, than allow building learning through interaction, even more in virtual. So, yeah, what we can get from here is that, yeah, we're only there to facilitate knowledge. And that's our main job, is to provide the proper strategies for them to, to learn. Yes, totally, totally true. Okay, yeah. so may I, can I continue? Yes, or there's another comment? Uh, we have a uh, few people saying that, or requesting, to have a copy of your PPT. I don't know if that is going, might be possible, or we can use, I mean, as long as they, you know, they credit you for, uh, for the PPTs, but I think that, you know, they could, they can work it out. If they watch the live recording, maybe they can build their own PPTs and share them with their students. Yeah, um, I think you guys are streaming this and recording it, right? So you will have access to the presentation yeah. on YouTube channel from Ben Tizzle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can definitely post okay. it here and copy the things that you need to copy and adapt it to, uh, to what you're going to do in your setting. Yeah. Yes, okay. So the outcome, the outcomes or the competent, I mean, we, we want is competent learners, not only in the language use, but in the way they use it, where they use it. So I'm gonna show you a, a video. I have to lower the quality of the video because we're live, we're streaming, uh, we're sharing a screen. So I had to lower the quality of the video uh, a lot, uh, but you will see what students do in our school and what they have been able to get after being exposed to PPL. Hola, soy Bradley. Y en mis tiempos libres me gusta nadar, pero no le puedo hacer a Yo disfruto manejar mi camioneta gringa y como Mikey, can you listen to it or it stopped? Now uh, it stopped, but we can we can oh. hear a little bit of that. Yeah. Okay, now. Hola, soy Bradley. 
y en mis tiempos libres me gusta nadar, pero no lo puedo hacer ahorita. Yo disfruto manejar mi camioneta gringa y como afuera de casa con mi novia. Good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to the school in London. Um, I am your teacher, Mr. Bradley Young, and I'm going to be teaching over the coming months how to speak basic English. Perhaps you could tell me a little bit about yourself. Hello, Bradley. Uh, my name is Jose Felix Rodriguez. I'm from okay. Venezuela, uh, but I live in Quito, Ecuador. Okay, hello, Bradley. Uh, my name is Leandri Sanchez Vargas. I am from Cuba. I live in Ecuador. What do you find the most difficult? Um, speaking, listening, reading, or writing? Oh, speaking. Speaking is <laughs> the worst for me, yeah. Because I, I have practiced a lot of listening uh, in, in the internet, in podcasts. I'm, I'm trying, no? I'm trying to do that. Um, or maybe you see a, a movie and you don't put the, the translation there so you can practice. So just, this is just a brief example of what the students can do when they work on their BBL approach and when you do things in order to make the most from their experiences. Bradley started with us in March. And this is a video that was recorded in June when he was talking about what he likes and things. Uh, and now uh, uh, Ruth, and they are, she's now in basic three. And not only be, she's been able to talk to Bradley like the way you saw she was talking to him, but also uh, she was developing some presentations in, their, in her area of expertise. She's a dentist and she lives in the United States and now she had, she had I mean, she was called to, to get a job in her area finally. And she was asked to develop certain, I mean, uh, presentations to show that she can communicate not only in English, but also in the way uh, she addressed patients and everything. And she's been working on presentations. So she's been presenting also in class uh, information about um, diseases, dental diseases, treatments that are, are best for, for, for working on these diseases and, and how to, to, to eradicate them. So uh, it's great. It's great the way they have been working on. And you saw there another small video where Leo Andres from Cuba and then Jose Felix, who's in Ecuador, were talking to Bradley. Those are students in basic one. And they were able to talk to Bradley, not being afraid of it, uh, after their first three weeks of classes, say, yes, we, can, we want to try it. And they went for it. So it is about setting the environment, setting a good environment. It is about keeping it real. It's about giving the, the students the opportunity, not only to learn, but to use the language and motivating and encourage them. No matter in the level they are, they can reach certain competencies and you need to address that because they deserve that, I mean, to be addressed positively. Even if it's maybe that. Uh, I don't know if we have a question or something, Miguel. I think someone raised their hand. Yes, we do. Um, question over here. Um, so we have a comment from Roderick. Is there a big difference between project-based learning and problem-based learning, or we can use use both interchangeably? Uh, there is, I think there is a slight difference, if I'm not mistaken. I was just checking a problem-based learning uh, the other day. Uh, in the problem-based learning, there is always, uh, I mean, a problem to solve. And it's brought ma mainly by the teacher, okay? The need and the challenge that you work with in the project-based learning not necessarily have to be a problem, okay? The need is not a problem, but something to, to address. The problem is something that needs to be solved. So if I'm not mistaken, the problem-based uh, learning approach seeks more to develop, I mean, small tasks 
uh, directly, I mean, based on communicative things where students develop specific skills in discussions and other matters related to that. It's not that they are not alike, they do have certain things that are similar, but in project-based learning, you do not need specifically to bring out a problem to be solved. You can bring a challenge, like getting these competencies that you need. This is a challenge. We need to do this at the end of this, and it's not necessarily a problem. So I also think that in, in the case of the project-based learning, I mean, the goals are set in advance. Well, we want our students to uh, to develop at the end of this. So in the case of the uh, project-based uh, projects, then I think the goals or the learning goals is come on the go, and that they are set by the students and by the teacher at the moment. Yes. Yes. All right. That's true. Good. So, mm -hmm. so far, is there any other one? No. Can you no, we're done. Okay. Final considerations. It is an effective approach. I'm not saying it's the only one that works on remote teaching or in regular basis teaching, but this is effective. PBL is a flexible approach that can be implemented in both regular and remote teaching. And you have seen it, how we have been implementing it. And the result it has an impact. Students are able to work with the language. They just don't know the language. I know the language, but uh -huh, you know how to implement it? If they don't know how to implement it, how to, to apply the learning they have been having, then it was purposeless. So PBL focuses on that. I mean, it is flexible approach that can be implemented here and help the students work on the language. It offers teachers the opportunity to get the best for their students, not only from the language, but also in personal basis, being of a great help to others that need help in, I mean, during the learning process, I know a little bit more and I'm aware of that so I can be helpful for the other one so we can complete the task and both of us can get a good score and the competence we want, okay? It gets the best from them. Number three, students get not only language competencies but abilities to solve problems, working groups and experience meaningful learning. They are able to build process the learning process, not just by themselves and others, and address and be grateful because there are others that are contributing in their learning process, not just the teacher. It provides the tasks and activities that help students use what they know and relate it to real life situations. If you make your students relate everything you're teaching to their regular context, to their experience, to something they can live, they live, they will live, it will be helpful and meaningful and they will never forget that and use properly, it will make students aware of their competencies and foster the confidence any learner needs. It doesn't matter the approach you're using, you need to provide the confidence the student does not need. The students don't have confidence in themselves at the beginning. And if at the beginning they're not addressed this, whether it is the approach you're using, this one or any other one, I mean, it's gonna be very difficult for them I mean, in the, in the whole process, you know? So address their confidence, go for it. And if you use this approach properly, not you're not just gonna get the students to get competencies in language, but the other competencies, but they're gonna be confident when using those. So thank you very much for coming to my presentation today. And it, it, I mean, it's great to be here. Thank you, Ventiso, for Joining me, that's my contact information. You see there, if you need to reach me, I mean, that's how you can reach me. We're willing to be talking to you anytime you need. Uh, the author is corner also, uh, it's open. I mean, we have a, a community where teachers and learners can go to get free training in, in live sessions or in webinars, but you can see all that in our social networks. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Johannes. It has been a, a wonderful and very productive and meaningful uh, information you have been sharing with us today. I know that all of our participants today uh, appreciate it very much. I mean, they, in fact, they were requesting the PPTs uh, very often. Uh, but yeah, as we have said before, uh, you will find the recording of the session later today on our YouTube channel. And we're here to keep on providing these type of uh, sessions for you. We want to keep on, we want you to keep on learning. We want you to keep on 
uh, adapting new strategies to your context. Now that we're teaching online, well, see what we can do. I mean, and do our best for our students. Yes. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Johannes, for your time, for your expertise, and everyone else in, in this session for being here. I know that you're joining off from different countries um, and you're in different time zones. So thank you very much. I mean, and for being also also please participative. And yeah, thank you very much. And next week, every single Sunday, we have an event prepared for you. Next week, we have our session on Instagram. So it's a live talk. And we also hope you can join us and interact with us there. Thank you very much and have a great Sunday. Thank you very much for coming today. I'm grateful. Thank you very much, Fenty. So Mikey, thank you for being such a great help today. <laughs> No worries, Thank always you. welcome. Um, all right, so we will um, think before we now.